Anyways, happy Sunday, beautiful Sunday today. I'm glad you're here. I love you. I love this house. I love the body of Christ. Missing some folks that are dealing with issues, but they'll get back in the house in due time. Might have to go drag them in here, but we're going to get them back in the house and uh, just pray for folks. But I'm glad to be with you today and those on live stream and social media. We bless you and so glad for our family. Let me give you this message uh, that the Lord spoke to my heart and uh, just going to be just be pretty plain today. But here's what he said to me. He said, America, you're past the point of no return. Your golden idols of Christianity have failed to stop what has been written. The incantations of your false sermons preached by your false prophets has only quickened your downfall. America, the Christian nation, is a joke among the nations, a hissing heard concerning your demise. My judgments are increasing, but who is warning? My pressure is increasing, but who is listening? What is coming has been written, and no man can change this irreversible fact. My church must embrace this reality and with power and grace reap the final harvest. Heavenly Father, thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost and for the opportunity to speak into lives of men and women, children, wherever they may be, whatever ages and stages of their lives, I thank you for this opportunity with the power of media to declare and decree your words. Hide me now, I pray, behind the shadow of the cross that no man would remember my name, not even the name of this church, for we seek no fame, Father, no notoriety, but what we seek is to make the name of Jesus famous throughout the earth. Be glorified today in Jesus' name. And everybody everywhere said amen. And so this morning, again, it's going to be a straightforward message, a powerful message. Uh, but it's going to be twofold in purpose. One, it's going to deal with the indictments of a backslidden nation, a backslidden church, if you will, and some hope and some great things that God has prepared for us. Because I believe the message of the last days is a mixed message. Woe to the unrighteous, but hallelujah to the righteous. And you have to see it that way because that's the way God has designed it. And so I want to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, articulate this to you. The title that he gave me is called Irreversible. Irreversible. Again, it will be a hard message concerning sin and concerning the backslidden church. And again, as I mentioned, the incantations of your false prophets, false sermons that they preach, trying to get the attention of God by using God names and Bible verses when really their hearts are wicked. You know, you can be wicked and quote scripture. Uh, let, me, let me try that again. You could be wicked and quote scripture. In fact, the devil knows more scripture than you do. And if you've ever been around seances or Satanists, they quote scripture and they use it against you because most Christians are ignorant. They're ignorant to the devices of the enemy. So irreversible, we're going to see uh, what God has to say about that. He took me to Jeremiah chapter 32. Would you go there? Jeremiah chapter 32 not a bad birthday passage for Jeremiah. Or should I say from Jeremiah? Haven't been there in a little while. Jeremiah chapter 32. Let me know when you're there and I'll get preaching this message to you. Jeremiah chapter 32. <clears throat> 
verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, the king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For the king of Babylon, his army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. So we paint the picture of Zedekiah being the king and Nebuchadnezzar being the king of Babylon, and Jerusalem is besieged. Jerusalem is in a problem. Jerusalem has its enemies on the outside due to the enemies on the inside. And they're in great danger of losing their freedom and the kingdom and the king. But yet at the moment when they needed to hear from God the most, they shut up the prophet. That is when you know a nation is in decline and on the verge of going over into the abyss when they silence and shut up the prophet. You know in your own personal life when you're headed for destruction, when you're headed for doom and gloom and headed for a recompense of your reward for your actions, when you begin to push away prophetic people and push away the word of God and push away rebuke and push, push away discipline in order for you to stop up your ears so you can continue you on your merry way. It's been proven time and time again in history of kings and leaders who silenced the prophetic before destruction. And that's exactly what was taking place here with Judah, and it is exactly what is taking place here in America. It's exactly what's taking place in the church of America where we're silencing the prophets. I'm not talking about the prophet liars. I'm not talking about those that just want to go out and say all kinds of stuff that is so far from the reality of God and the reality of what's happening outside your doors. I'm talking about the true prophets and prophetess and the watchmen of God and the preachers of righteousness and holiness who are saying, thus saith the Lord. We're pushing them away. And that is one of the most dangerous things you could ever do. I remember a story by Dr. Lester Summerall who shared with us, and by the way, was a prophet of God, a real prophet, and a father in the faith, that he had a word for a particular large ministry, a husband and wife team. I won't go into details, but one of them wore a lot of makeup, and I won't say which one it was. And he had a word for them, and he was being interviewed on their television program, and he said to them, I need to speak to you after this interview because I have a word from the Lord for you. And the story goes on that after the smiles of the program and all the Christian false applauding, Come on, somebody. And the canned laughter and whatever's done in Christian TV production, the two hosts got up immediately, left their mics at the chair, and left the building while the prophet was waiting to tell them the word of the Lord. Within a few months, the entire ministry collapsed, and one of them went to prison. Dr. Summerall had a warning from God. The prophet was ready to speak, but they shut him up. Is anybody here today? And there are stories and stories and stories that we all could share of people whom we've tried to warn, but they shut us up. So verse 2, for the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem. 
And Jeremiah, the lifeline to God, the very prophet of God, shut up in the court of the prisons because of the king of Judah's house. I'm telling you, it's never the right time to shut up a prophet. I said it's never the right time to shut up God's true prophet. Verse 3, for Zedekiah, king of Judah, shut him up saying, wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord. In other words, how can you and how dare you begin to prophesy against me, the king of Judah? Sometimes there are people in high places who don't want to hear the prophetic reality. They don't want to hear what is being said because it doesn't come from the proper channels. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you in your own family, people don't want to hear from because you don't fit the proper criteria of a prophet. You don't fit the proper criteria to tell me. I, I know your bank account. I, I know your income. I, I know where you're from. Who are you to tell me? So he said, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Didn't like that, did he? He didn't like the prophecy that he was going to come and take the city. Again, we find that here in America where people all across the fruited plains, all across this nation, they don't want to hear from the prophets of doom and gloom, if you will, the fire and brimstone. They don't want to hear from folks that have a thus saith the Lord message that is hard. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to experience it. They want to hear the stay puff marshmallow preaching Come on, with Pastor Sunshine, who's always happy. Everything's just wonderful. Not a problem in the world. He has that beautiful pearl drop teeth. Come on, that smile. Y'all, some of y'all remember that commercial from the pearl drop. Just ding, everything was beautiful and wonderful. But nobody wants to hear from the, they want the doom and gloom guy. They, they want to hear something that's wonderful. And how do I get money? And, and how do I buck? And how do I shout? And how do you move me, preacher, into my destiny? And how do you move me into to the higher life and the higher calling and all of these things? And there are times when we move into understanding of our destiny and the things of God, but constantly Come on, somebody, constantly you have to be fed this garbage. Constantly you have to be stoked. Constantly you got to be told how wonderful you are when there are times in life when we have to listen to what the Lord says and it may be something that is hard. Watch this. Zedekiah the king of Judah, verse 4, shall not escape. Everybody say, shall not escape. Shall not escape. I'm here to tell you today, the American church, and anybody that will listen, we are not going to escape what is coming. And Zedekiah, wait, wait, maybe I should start all over again. That would be awesome. I get to preach all over again. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, he shall not escape. You got to think about this for a second Paint in your mind this picture. Here is this king. He's in his royalty. He's in his majesty. He's still got his concubines and porcupines. Come on, somebody. He's still got his money. He's still got his Bentley, his Bugatti. He's got all that stuff still out there, man. He's hot to trot. He's got the ring on his fingers. He's got the outfits. He's got the Gucci. Everything is happening, going his way. Oh, yeah, there's an enemy outside, but it's all right because I'm still here. 
And the mindset blinds folks of what's happening. It's called deception. And it's happening right here in the United States where we're looking at what's happening around the world. And we say, oh, it's not going to happen to us. And, and then, oh, we're breaking free finally. And lockdown is gone. And, and now we're going to party like it's 1999. And all the other stuff is offshore. When the reality is it's happening to us right now, it's increasing and God is not going to relent it is going to get absolutely more extreme as we move forward and we shall not escape but again we don't want to hear that just like the king didn't want to hear it so he went ahead and he shut up the prophet and he put him into prison he said I'm going to deal with you Jeremiah I'm going to shut you up but how many of y'all know you cannot shut up the word of the Lord? In fact, the word was so powerful that the king just re-prophesied it. Think about it for a second. The king had to talk about it. The king had to admit what was taking place. You shall not escape out of the hand of the Chaldeans, for surely he shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with them mouth to mouth, and his eyes shall behold his eyes. Here's, here's what the prophet said. The prophet said, you're going to see this day. Watch this now. The prophet said, you're going to see this day. A lot of folks, a lot of prophets of the older days and older generation prophesied the mess we're in. Nobody wanted to believe it prophesied of, of the militancy outside of the church or within the church, prophesied of the sewage of homosexuality and lesbianism and perversion and alcoholism and anything else you want to throw and stick to the wall of what's happening in our country and the heart of man. They prophesied America would be this way, and we didn't want to hear it. The newer generation with technology denied the preachers the right of their access to God and their ability to speak for the prophetic word, and they shut them up. But they said, you will see this day. And Jeremiah prophesied, he said, you will see the king of Babylon. You will absolutely see it. But you know what's really crazy is Ezekiel said the same thing. Watch this now. Ezekiel said that he would see the king. He would actually see Babylon. In 2 Kings chapter 25, he prophesied it. But do you know something? He actually didn't see it, but yet he did see it. They took his eyes out. In other words, he did see them face to face and he did enter into Babylon and there was no contradiction. The reality of the two prophets was this, that he would go into captivity. He would know and experience captivity, but his eyes would be removed. Are you here? When you go into captivity, you lose your sight. You lose vision. You lose perception. You lose understanding. And because America is in captivity, we can't see this. We can't see the reality. We can't see the prophetic judgments that are happening in our country. And we blame it on climate change. We blame it on politics. We blame it on this. We blame it on the rain. And we blame everything else instead of looking to our hearts and saying, God, it is us. We are unclean. We are unclean righteous before you and the prophets were right let me tell you something the prophets will always be right when they prophesy the word of God they will all be always be right when they speak forth line upon line and precept upon precept are you still alive but he surely, surely shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon and shall speak unto him mouth to mouth and, and eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall, be, he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon. Now don't forget this is the same Zedekiah that the false prophet Hananiah in chapter 28 or so began to prophesy and say it's not going to happen. 
Just like we heard the past four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago, 25 years ago, when the Hananias would prophesy great prosperity of our nation, peace and safety in our times, and we would have leaders that would lead us into righteousness. Come on, somebody. We would have all these great white hopes to help us, and white is not speaking of a color. I'm talking about self-righteousness, and they're going to bring us into this utopia when we've gone farther and farther into the abyss. And so this same type of spirit, the Hananiah spirit, is, on a, is upon the false church of America as it was upon Judah. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Now notice that you and I don't have a parole date you and I do not have the ability to get out of anything until God visits us. Man does not have the ability to escape judgment until he says, forgive me. Man does not have the opportunity to get away from disaster until he repents. So in other words, if a nation does not listen to the prophetic, they shut up the prophets and don't want to hear them, and if they don't hear the word of the Lord and obey the word of the Lord, then they reject it and they never repent, and if they don't repent, then God will not relent. That is just the way it works. And we're seeing it in our country. That's why it is becoming more vile. Somebody needs to help me. And he shall lead the king Zedekiah to Babylon, and there he shall be until I visit him. Thus saith the Lord, watch this, though you fight with the Chaldeans, you will not prosper. See, I'm not liked very much today, Ronnie, because this message, people are going to thumb me down, they're going to get all mad. Listen, I am all for Christian militancy. What do I mean by that? Before my critics write me some nasty letter, I'm not talking about bombs and bullets and armament. I'm talking about prayer, advocacy. I'm, I'm talking about standing up. I'm, I'm talking about empowering our teachers and, and empowering those who are fighting for pro-life and, and all those things that are out there and, and, and the sanctity of marriage. I'm for those activities, but I understand that we are not going to win this war through our own fleshly accomplishments, but that doesn't mean I don't fight. Come on, somebody. I'm not going to get into a fight with somebody and sit in a corner and let them pull at me and just beat me and just tear me apart. I'm going to at least swing. Come on. I'm going to come out with some piece of flesh. Remember that? I heard that growing up. I'm going to get a piece of your flesh before I leave. Come on. They may carry me out, drag me out, and bury me in the backyard, but they're going to know they've been in a fight. Is anybody here today? And so that's the concept. I have to understand that. And this is exactly what was going on. The prophets prophesied and said, look, you may have an army. You may have strength. You may have a quasi-God behind you from your past, but I'm telling you, this is the word of the Lord, though you fight you will not win and I'll flip this over in this irreversible message today that what the church what the world is going through what this nation is going through we think that we can change this through a political process we can change this by giving out stimulus money we can change this by giving out new jobs and all these different socialistic type of models and experiments they will not work they will not prosper why because you fight against it's God. It is a bag with holes in it. No matter how much money we print, no matter how much we try to do this and do that, we are defeated because we fight against God. It's irreversible. One side of that message sounds hopeless. It is for those who don't know Christ, for those that refuse to receive the goodness of God and the grace of repentance 
But it's a good message because what God is going to do for us is irreversible. It's a good thing. It is written. He's going to take care of the church. We've got a promise. We've got a blessing. We've got eternity with God. Watch this now. Watch this. They're trying to make you a little happy because you're, you're a little sad. You, sh you shall not prosper. Come on, Jeremiah, man. I, I used to like you, but man, I, I don't know, man. Every time you talk, it's always something bad. Can I tell you something? This prophecy was spoken to Zedekiah, was spoken to Judah. It was one, about one year before he was led away and they all went into captivity. God gave them about a year. God gave them about a year in this irreversible prophecy. God gave them a year. Watch this. You say, could, could, could they change some things? I think they could have changed some of it, but not the totality of it. In other words, when there's a prophetic word of judgment and God is going to discipline and God is going to judge, it is absolutely written, but you don't have to be a part of it. See, this is, this is what people don't understand about destiny. Nobody's destined to, to be damned. Everybody can jump off that ship, the Titanic, and swim to safety and get into the boat of God. They can get into the harbor of God, the safe harbor, if they want to. The problem is they don't want to, but within a year. And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hamil, the son of Shilom, thine uncle, which is really translated as cousin, shall come unto thee, saying, it was a bit of his, uh, his cousin, uh, by thy field that is an Anathal. Anathal. Now, wait a minute now. I want you to see this here. This is where I want you to get a little bit of hope. So Shilom, the cousin, or his uncle, but the cousin, he comes over there to, 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 to Jeremiah, and he says, like, I want you to buy a field. Now, this is kind of weird because here's Jeremiah. He's in the prison. Is that right? But then he says, I want you to buy this field that is an Anathoth. Now look here, cuz. I know Uncle So-and-So sent you over here, but, but I think y'all been drinking a little too much wine. A little fig juice. Sun done hit you a little too hard on your old noggin. Uh, can't you understand I'm in jail? Can't you understand I have no use for this property? Let me share something with you. In fact, the property was considered useless. Why? Because it was in Babylonian captivity. They had already besieged Jerusalem, and Anathoth, where the property was, was already fortified by the enemy. Right. Watch this now. But God so told Jeremiah, hey, here's the deal. I'm going to send you your cuz. He's going to come over here, and he's going to ask you to buy for the right of redemption this property. Now watch this. This will make sense in just a minute. And so he came. He said, buy the field that is an Anathoth for the right of the redemption, which is the Kingsman redemption. You all know what that is, Kingsman redeemer. It means that when there is property that somebody owns in your family and the mortgage is due and they cannot pay for it again. They cannot own it any further. You go to the nearest of kin and you go to the nearest of kin and you ask him to pay for the property and the property comes to the nearest of kin. And when the time of release comes, then that Kingsman Redeemer gives the land back to the original owner and it stays in the family. None of you all have family like that, do you? Come on, folks. You do, you do something set up like that with one of your family members, it'll be on Craigslist the next day. Right. You all know what I'm talking about, especially Uncle Swick, Slick Willie. Or if you go off somewhere, you, you got a little prison term or something like that, you come home, you ain't got nothing. Y'all, y'all ain't helping. Some of y'all got good family. Hmm. 
But that's the way the Kingsman Redeemer or Kingsman of, of Redemption was done, the right of redemption. And so here is Jeremiah. He knows this is family, but yet he also understands that this property is an enemy held territory, but yet God is telling him to buy it. Now, let me show you something prophetically. What the Lord was showing Jeremiah, I'm going to use this as a sign and as a wonder that I want you to buy something into your future that the enemy has already captured because I promise you I'm going to send you back to that place and I'm going to give you that place. I'm going to redeem that place. I'm going to restore that place. But if you don't sow into your future, you've got nothing waiting for you. And it is the same concept for the American church. I know my future is captivity in this nation. I know it is judgment. I know it is written. I know God is going to deal with us. And the extremes, extremes, extremes will continue in this nation. But I am sowing into the millennium. I am sowing into my future. I am sowing into what God has promised us. And the, what, what he's promised us is a tremendous harvest. So I don't sit back under the umbrella of a prophecy and cry when it rains and get upset. I get up like Jeremiah did and I begin to sow into my future. I wish I had somebody that understood what I just said. That's why we're winning souls. That's why we're preaching the gospel. That's why we're reaching the nations of the earth. And we're going to continue to do so and increase it no matter what it looks like in my natural eyes. Because I see beyond these four walls. I see beyond these chairs. I see beyond that camera. I see beyond this place. And look and see the harvest is wide. It's ready. And I'm sowing into it. I'm sowing into my future. That's why I'm not afraid. That's why I'm not hanging out and hiding out in some bunker. I'm preparing for that day, but I'm sowing into the future. Can anybody say amen? And that's the difference between what we're doing here and everybody else that's selling doom and gloom and fear porn. Feel pretty good this morning. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send your cuz over there. And I want you to buy it. So Hamil, my uncle's son came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord. And he said unto me, buy my field. And I pray thee, that is in Amathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. The right for the inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And so he hears from the Lord, and he says, this is what I'm going to do. And then the manifestation comes in reality, and he obeyed. Fast forward to verse 13. And I charged Barak before them, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both which is sealed and the evidence which is open. In other words, take the paper, the deeds, the bill of sale, one is open and one is sealed. And he did it in such a manner in order that if one was ruined, the other would be there. It was a time of war, by the way. I said it was a time of war. And he needed to make sure that this purchase was secured because he had full confidence God was going to fulfill it. Watch this now. It's the same understanding of sowing into our future. I understand and I'm confident. I'm persuaded like Paul said. I'm persuaded in my future, though it looks terrible and it's hell and high water and it's problems and insanity and extremes are taking place. I'm still going to sow and believe and seal up this word in my heart because I know I'm going to possess that land. I know I'm going to possess the promise of my family born again and those on the prayer cross here at Ignited Church. I believe in the future. I know that God has it all under control and he's going to take care of us and all that I need to do is trust in him. 
and it will come to pass. You see, again, that is the difference between those that are preaching hopelessness and those of us who are preaching hope. We're believing for a glorious future in Jesus Christ. Again, I'm not talking about everybody having a flat screen television. Come on now, and all these luxuries of life, this is nothing compared to what heaven has to offer us. This is nothing in comparison to what God has planned for all that believe in him. The promises of God are yea and they're amen. Watch this. You still alive? All right. He said, I'm going to purchase this which is sealed. I'm going to put it into an earthen vessel. Jeremiah is always hiding something, isn't he? <laughs> He's always putting something in a rock or a hole somewhere. But I want you to put it in the earth and vessel. That's a good thing to do. Why? Because you need to bear it because the army's coming. Listen to me. You need to put this in your earth and vessel. You need to put this promises in your heart. You need to put this deep inside of your heart that no man can rob you. Seal it up and recognize and realize. Because I'm going to tell you something. You're going to need to have this hope in you in the coming days. You're going to have to have clarity of vision because there's so many people that are confused right now. They don't know who to believe. They don't know the prophetic word to believe. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know up from down, left to right. They're confused. But when you have it sealed and you understand and you put it in that vessel, you know that God is going to fulfill his promise. It's a sealed deal. You're going to need it. You say, how do you know, preacher? Because I already know people who are falling away. They're falling away every time the stock market drops 10 points. I'm about to run around this building. Every time there's an earthquake, it's over. Folks, help me. Breaking news, man, coming on out on the, on the internet and whatever, and I get emails all the time. A frog croaked. Oh, I wish I had somebody help me on my birthday. I mean, it's, it's, you know what I'm talking about. Every time the door squeaks, it's a ghost. Every time something takes place, it's a sign. Listen. We got to get to the place where it is sealed in our hearts of what's happening and we understand and we recognize and realize and so into our future, into that place. And did I tell you what Anathoth means? The name Anathoth means answered prayers. That's what it means. He said to Jeremiah, so into your answered prayers, so into that place that's in held in enemy captivity, enemy boundaries, but it will be the place where your prayers are answered. Come on now. I'm sowing into my future. I'm sowing into answered prayers. I'm not sowing in the wind and, and throwing stuff prophetically at the dartboard hoping it sticks. This isn't pin the tail on the donkey. This is the word of the living God, and it is a sure word. It will come to pass, for it has been written. See, you wouldn't be so nervous. You wouldn't be so nervous and skittish. As a, as, a, as a Christian, if you just study the Bible. You say, Pastor, are you worried? No, zero, none. Only thing concerns me is people doing the right things because if enough of us do the right things, we're going to be all right. I know I've rescued people before, and the worst thing they ever do to try to rescue somebody is they try to unrescue you. If that made any sense to you, that means they trying to take you down with them when you're trying to save them. But if you got a plan and you know what you're doing together, we're going to be all right. That's why I want to hang out with you. Now watch this. He says, God, the evidence put inside the, the earthen vessels that it may continue many days. Now, now here, here's, here's where we get messed up. It shall continue many days. Now, we, especially in the American church, when we say many days, we talking about a day or two. Because one day is too many. You go overseas and they tell you, we'll get with you in several days from now. It'll be about a month. Because some nations, they don't go by time. They don't care. 
When Jennifer and I were over in Rwanda, they said, we're going to go take lunch at 12. We said, okay, we'll be over at 1 o'clock. And they said, no, we go from 12 to 2. They take two-hour Dutch lunches. I'm like, two o'clock? Two hours? In America, you might get 20 minutes. You get 20 minutes of indigestion. So some folks don't understand many days, especially when it comes to the things of God, because we want the presto magico God. Come on, we want the Pop-Tart God. We want to put them in there, and we want to wait 30 seconds if 60 is too long, and we want it to pop up and be fresh and have the bread already buttered. Many days. How many, many days, Jeremiah? 70 years. It was a 70-year sealed prophecy. 70 years. This was sealed up in earthen vessels. And God told Jeremiah, I want you to do this, son. I want you to buy that field. I want you to sow into answered prayers. I want you to sow into faith. I want you to sow into your destiny. I want you to sow into purpose and be persuaded and to be determined that I'm going to do it. And it will take 70 years. But when that 70 years is accomplished, you will pass off that property to the next generation. I'm telling you, we got to look beyond ourselves. We got to look at the future generation. We got to sow into foreign nations. We got to sow into the body of Christ. We got to reach the least, the lost, and the last of the world. And we cannot be so caught up in what's happening to us right here in the United States of America. We must view the way God views life. You must see it the way he does. For many days. Could you imagine 70 years? Some of us can't wait seven hours no, I know that. I know that. There's some, some Christians, they say, please pray with me. I pray with them. And then they, they look around, nothing happened. Well, maybe you need to pray again. Okay, let's pray again. Nothing happened. Seven hours, seven days, seven weeks, seven months, seven years, whatever. And things don't particularly happen. And there's a reason why certain things don't happen. And then they get mad and frustrated with God. Seventy years. Jeremiah had to wait. Verse 15, for thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. He said, Jeremiah, I'm just going to remind you of the prophecy. It's going to be 70 years, but everybody's going to possess the land. See, church, you need to listen to me. Those that are watching me that you're weary you're worried, you're wounded, it's going to come to pass. God is going to get the victory for you. He's going to make it happen. Our families are going to be born again. He's going to bring us through tribulations and trials and testings. He's going to bring us through the storms. He's going to bring us through to the other side. He's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. But we have to seal this truth up. We have to seal it up and believe and keep sowing into our future. Do you realize and recognize, Church of Jesus Christ, you are sowing into you your eternity, what you're doing? right now in your flesh what you're doing right now as a believer you are sowing into your eternity it is either going to be hay and stubble or it's going to be gold it's up to you I choose gold I said I choose gold gold to give to my master crowns to lay at his feet weeping and tears for how good he's been to me because my life is nothing but default your life is nothing but default we have to learn this principle, and God's going to teach us this. I'm telling you, you're not going to like this, but you will learn your lesson. I said, you'll learn your lesson. If you don't hear this preacher today, and you don't obey the words of the Lord, you will obey the lessons of the Lord. I wish I had somebody help me. I would rather obey the words of the Lord instruction, for only a fool rejects instruction and receives fleshly wounds on his back, Proverbs declares to us. I would rather not have any wounds. Fast forward to verse 22. And hast given them this land, which thou didst swear 
to the fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. So in that particular part that I fast forwarded, he's talking, Jeremiah's talking about how great God is. He's talking about everything that God did to bring them to the land of milk and honey and all the blessings. But watch verse 23, and they came in and possessed it. That's one thing to possess something from God. It's another thing to hold on to it. You can, profess, you can possess and confess salvation, but it's a whole nother thing to possess it and to maintain it as you move through life, especially these many days of 70 years. Uh-huh. You see, it's not for the swift. It's those who endure. I wish I had somebody, some seasoned Christians in the room. It's for those that know how to get knocked down and get back up and say, I'm still standing. To have failure and success mingled together with tears and laughter and say, I'm still standing. Come on, somebody. It's somebody that knows how to take these things in life and recognize and realize that joy comes in the morning and crying ain't going to last all night. Oh, see, those are the kind of people I want to hang out. I'm not in the weekend warriors. <laughs> I'm not in the weekend warriors. I'm not into casual relationships. I want something deep rooted, something that's going to last. I want to know who's in the foxhole with me. And so they came in and possessed it. But watch this, three reasons for God to destroy Judah and three reasons at the minimum of why he will deal with America and destroy it. Number one, but they obeyed not my voice. They obeyed not thy voice. <clears throat> the number one reason for destruction for a church and for a nation is you don't obey the voice of God. You got your own voice. You got your own opinion. You're smarter than everybody else. Never been to school before, but you're smarter than everybody else. Never read a book about a certain subject, but you know everything about it because you heard something, something about it. I wish I had somebody to help me. Know everything about God because you went to church, but you don't even know God. I'm talking to preachers too who can stand up and have the ability to move people and woo them and wall, wow them and all these different things that we do when we get up here and we minister and they don't even know the God they say they serve because they don't serve the God they say they know. <laughs> say that five times real fast. So they would not obey the voice. Number two, neither walk by thy law. The second indictment, the second reason why he was going to destroy them and send them into Babylonian captivity is they would not walk in the law. What does that mean, preacher? They wouldn't follow the word. Well, I don't know. You know, see, the way I was taught in the university By Professor P. Brain, <laughs> I, I, I was taught that, you know, if, if a man's attracted to a man, it's just biological. And, and that it's okay because if a woman has an abortion, it's just a blob of flesh inside. Come on now. And there's no moral connection whatsoever. And you got this brain full of rocks talking to you, acting like they know morality. And they won't follow the law, which is the word of God. And they reject the prophetic and they lock up and shut up the prophetic. And they say, I don't want to hear you. We will march in our pride. We will go after your children. We will do all these things we want to do because we've got a God unto ourselves. And we refuse to follow your law, including preachers. I know churches right now where pastors are hooking up with feathers, other folks and, and doing things they shouldn't do and it's rampant in the house. Why? Because what's on the head is on the body. It's the same spirit. You better watch who you hang out with. 
Got all kinds of hooking up together going on. It's nothing but a frat house. I said it's nothing but a frat house. Why? Because they won't walk in the law. They can preach the law, but they can't walk in it. Come on now. Get up there, can hack and preach and scream and holler, and they ain't even following the law. But they preaching good for a paycheck. I need some people that want to live right. That's who I want around me. I want some true, blue, transparent folk. I can trust them. Finally, the third thing is they have done nothing at all that thou commandest them to do. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't walk in your word, and they wouldn't do anything you told them to do. I don't understand, preacher. Why is these things happening in our world? Why is everybody shooting everybody? You wouldn't listen. You're not walking in the law, and you won't do anything about it. This is talking to righteous Judah, the religious folk. This is the same prophetic message I have today. It's irreversible dealing with the church. God is going to judge the earth. He's going to judge the church. And the reasons are very apparent. We don't want to do what God wants us to do. We don't want to follow his commandments. We don't. Listen. I have learned something. The more that I refuse the world and push it back, the more disciplined I come, become and the stronger I am spiritually to resist the devil. Resist the devil and he must flee from you. It doesn't mean that I become Teflon. It just means that my enemy becomes bigger, but the bigger he is, the stronger I become. Help me, church. But if we give in when that little gnat of a demon comes against us and we fall and we falter and falter and we don't fight back, then we become weak and we always become susceptible to defeat. I said a lot there. I said, I said a lot there. We don't want to follow the commandments. We don't want to push back. I'm going to tell you something. One of the things that I have the greatest problem with, with the church right now is being weak need, cowards. Say it to my face, okay? Cowards. One more time. Cowards. We have so many cowards in the church that do not want to face people. They do not want to go toe-to-toe with them. They don't want to go nose-to-nose with them and tell them like a T.I. is, like it is. They don't want to tell them. They don't want to say, hey, you're in sin. Hey, you're doing wrong. Hey, you need to do this. Hey, I love you and I'm trying to help you. No, they don't want to do that. They don't want to fight against the militancy. Thank God some people are, are pushing back against the militant folks that are out there. Some of y'all may have seen uh, the San Francisco Gay Community Choir who just released a video where they're singing about taking our children and coming after our children. And then when the heat was turned on them by some militant Christians, some real folk, they said, oh, it was tongue in cheek. Now, let me tell you this. If I got up and did the reverse and said, we're coming for your family or something like that, they'd be knocking at my door. FBI, hello. Come on now. They would be castigating the church, saying that they're a militant cult and some militia, and they trying to, y'all ain't helping me. You know they would flip it. They would flip it. They put, bro, they put Brother Ronnie in a white, a white outfit, y'all. That's all I'll do. With two holes. We'll leave it at that. You know it's the truth. But even though they would say things like that, we can't be cowards. We got to at least stand up and say, oh, I am going to the place of answered prayer. I'm going to Anathal. I'm going to the place of promise, even though it seems like to be in captivity. You ain't taking my children. You ain't coming after my children. You ain't putting your pedophilia spirit on my children. And any other child that I can influence, you ain't doing it. Ah, see. We don't want to do it. We don't, we're cowards. We don't want to fight nobody. We don't want nobody to be mad at us. 
let me tell you something. They hate you. They hate you. They hate you. The world hates you. This whole world from the media all the way down to the cesspool of politics or vice versa, they hate you. And the agenda is to destroy the cross. The agenda is to pervert the cross. The agenda is to pollute the word. The agenda is to pollute you. And they hate you. And you, church, that are cowards, you want to just comply and conform and get along with everybody. Why can't we all just get along, Pastor? Because the devil has come to steal, kill, and, and to destroy. I am not going to compromise when he is trying to destroy the children and the heritage of God. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not doing it. Because if you give him a little bit, he's going to take a lot. I don't have time to read you an article about what's happening over in Canada, but you know that they're burning churches in Canada? They're burning churches down in Canada. I don't have time to compare with you what is happening in Canada. They are already ahead of us. They had gay marriage back in 2005. Ours was in 15. They're already ahead of us. They're already arresting pastors. They're already fining people for saying things against the homosexual community, whether it's biblical or not. It's called hate speech. And all this is in the pike for America. So you can see a precursor by looking at Canada and their legislative system concerning the church to get a snapshot of what's coming to America. And not only that, just look at China. But see here again, shut that Jeremiah up. Shut that prophet up. We don't want to hear him. No, 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 we don't want to hear him. It can't happen. It's already happening. But we won't compromise? You're crazy. In the words of Nacho Libre, you're crazy. I'm not listening to you. Some of y'all never know, never seen that movie before. So that just went over your head. My children are like, yeah, Nacho. Nacho Libre, huh? You're crazy, man. You're, cra you're crazy if I'm going to let them stomp a hole in my back and walk over my family, walk over this ministry, walk over our lives while we have a breath and we have a mandate from God to preach righteousness and holiness. I'm talking to the militant people. I'm coming against those who have an agenda and an army behind them to destroy this word and destroy his people. That's who I'm talking to. I'm not talking about to the sinner. I'm not against the sinner. I was a sinner. Come on, saved by grace. I want everybody to be born again. But if you're going to fight me, we're going to fight on holy ground. That's right. I'm going to give up and kick my legs up like a puppy. I almost said something. I, I got I to go. I just got a couple minutes. Y'all all right? I've been doing my best to try to preach today. Therefore, thou hast caused all this evil to come upon them. You did it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, the Lord spoke, spoke to me many years ago. He said, I will be justified for what I'm going to do. You're going to shake your fist at heaven and God's going to say, uh-uh, I've been justified. Behold, watch this, the mounts, they are coming to the city to take it. And the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans. What does it mean, the mounts? Read that one more time with me. Behold, the mounts, they are coming to the city to take it. Watch this now. You got to give me just a couple more minutes. The mounts. What it means is, is a mound of earth or a mound of dirt. It was used by the enemy as a way to get over the walls of the fortified city. Now, as far as I know, they did not have a John Deere or Caterpillar. Help me, Brother Ronnie. Maybe you know a little more theology than me, but I don't think they had an earth mover. So what had happened was they had to buy bucket by bucket, shovel by shovel, soldier by soldier, day by day, inch by inch, they began to make a mound of dirt until it reached the high tops of the wall. 
And the prophetic significance of what I just said to you is exactly what has happened to America concerning our captivity over the years. The enemy has been mounting dirt. He's been mounting dirt. He's been mounting dirt. And our watchmen have been warning and nobody has taken this to heart. And we've allowed him to build and build and build till now it is too late. He's over the wall. He's invested in, he's infested our city. He's infested our schools. He's infested our preachers. And he's infested our politicians. And the enemy is loose in the camp. And we shut the prophet up. Shut your mouth. I don't want to hear it. Hush. I'm done listening to you. It didn't matter. As much as they shut up the prophets, they still built the mounts. And that's what's been happening in America in our schools. We took prayer out of it. Abortion, gay rights, gay marriage, you name it. Open pornography on our cable channels to where our children, while you're asleep, all they have to do is roll out of their little beds and flip on your $200 plus a month junk box that you pay so ignorantly for, in my humble opinion, and watch some of the most perverse things on the planet. Oh, by the way, it might have been some of daddy's subscriptions anyways. Is anybody here? They made up the mounts. They came into the city to take it, and the city is given into the hand of the Chaldeans that fight against it. Here's the three things, and I'm leaving you, that were the recompense. Because of the sword, because of the famine, and because of the pestilence. If you cannot see in America violence, I don't know where you live. It seems to be in every small town, in every large city, there's violent crimes taking place. I've never seen such a day. I've never seen such a day. Even in our little town here, it's happening. Famine. Famine is not just hunger for the things that make the stomach pine away. Famine is also dealt with when it comes to the word of the Lord. It also can be from nutrition. I don't have time to go into the statistics of America of how many young people are hungry, but it's so bad in America that we have to have little lunch box locations for our children during the summer. Have you ever heard of such a thing? And there's more to be said on that. And finally, pestilence. You may think these things that are happening in our nation are a joke. And maybe some things concerning this crisis is overplayed. There's no doubt. But there is a reality to it. And you haven't seen anything yet. Jesus prophesied that these days would come and it would be in such a manner that it have never been recorded before in all of history. And I believe Jesus. As I close with this message, irreversible, I want to encourage the body of Christ to reach into the future by winning souls and reaping a harvest for God, by believing that God has a plan for us and not to become cowards and to be yellow belly and to hide during this storm, but to stand up and be counted and say something in this hour, investing into the future, reaching the youth, the young people with the power of truth, with a life of example, we may not win everybody, but we can win some and make their life change forever. 
If you're watching me right now and you don't know, do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't have to be a part of those who die and go to hell without God. You can make it right, right this moment. Just confess your sins with your tongue and say, Lord, I've done these things. There are too many to tell you, but Lord, I know you know it all. And I ask for you to forgive me and wash me clean with the blood of Jesus. Not everything will be right, right away, but the Lord will help you if you walk with him. If you're backslidden, today's the day to make it right. Today's the day to come on back to the Father's house. He loves you and has an amazing plan for you. Father God, thank you for this message today. I pray that it would go far and wide, not for me, but for you, for your praise, your honor, and your glory. And may somebody take these truths and run with them and invest in their future. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I love you. I will see you Wednesday for Revelation Road. Be blessed.